Okay, we're going to restart. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, our colleague, Peter Singer, um, author of multiple books, strategist and senior fellow at New America, uh, professor of practice at Arizona State, and he will moderate the discussion with uh, Vice Admiral, with Admiral Christopher Grady, who is the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it is a great honor um, and a pleasure to uh, welcome Admiral Chris Grady, who is a native of Newport, Rhode Island, and the 12th Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. One of the things that's um, very interesting uh, about his career is the range of assignments that he's had, from commanding um, mine countermeasure ships to destroyer squadrons, carrier strike groups to U.S. Fleet Forces Command. But perhaps most notably, you are the Navy's official old salt. That's right. Which, um, for those of you that don't know, uh, that not only recognizes um, his extensive knowledge and expertise, but also that he is the longest serving active duty surface warfare officer in the Navy. So um, it's great to have not just a SWO, but literally the SWO who's led the way. Um, Last man standing. <laughs> So um, let's begin, and um, it's interesting uh, in that the vice uh, chief is, uh, sorry, the vice chairman is the nation's second highest ranking military officer, but for those of us in the room, let's admit it, um, people in national security circles don't have a full appreciation or understanding of what the vice chairman does. So can you talk to us not only about the role, but also what are your personal key focus areas in sure. that role? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and first, let me thank CNAS for putting all this together. Oh, no. Is, Don't uh, thank them. Thank New America. Uh, Different one. C oh, sorry. Yeah, New America, right. <laughs> Similar There's, acronym, though. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> very much the DC thing of taking the names and, and shaking, shaking them, them up. Shaking them up, yeah. Um, but thanks for doing this. It's really important. And the agenda that you have set up here is really fascinating. Uh, yeah, the vice chairmanship is a is a really interesting one. Um, it's one that uh, you know, I, 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 the way I envision it is, I live in four worlds. The first one is strategy and policy, um, and so think of being a member of the Joint Chiefs that I am. Um, think of being on the deputies committee over at the White House, or on the principals committee representing the the chairman, being in the tank as one of the Joint Chiefs. I'm the first, as an example, for whom the job is four years, and I'm also the first for whom I cannot do anything else. This is, in fact, my last uh, my last job. So the policy piece is there. Then there's the requirements. So I'm the chairman of the. Uh, uh, the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is a joint staff run, but not joint staff entity. It's the vice chiefs and I sitting around the table with entities from OSD who help advise us on the way ahead in terms of establishing the requirement to, uh, to go out and fight and win. I also am a co-chair of the Deputies Management Action Group, so that's the budgeting side of the house, so my role there is to take what we learn in the JROC, bring it to the table, and have those informed discussions about how we want to build the budget into the future. And then the final world is the acquisition space, where we sit on the Defense Acquisition Board um, with Bill LaPlante and his team on the major defense acquisition programs. So it's a unique position to be in, and to kind of, if you were to do a Venn diagram, in the middle of that is the, is the, is the vice chairman. As an interesting aside, um, you know, I go to the deputies committees, not necessarily with uh, Secretary Hicks, she goes when she needs to, but that's normally with OSG, uh, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. That's my, uh, that's my colleague in that. So again, a unique position where I play in all of those worlds. Um, so how does, one, how does one drive to that? And this gets to set part two of your question. Well, I have three end states that I'm trying to drive through, uh, to drive to in my job. The first um, is joint force overmatch now and in the future. So let's parse that just a little bit. I'm here to tell you that all of the problems that we face uh, in terms of the joint, uh, in terms of uh, war fighting, are joint problems. With the possible exception of the undersea, where the Navy will probably continue to own 90% uh, of that, 95% of that, everything else is a joint problem. And then we want overmatch. Um, we don't want a fair fight. And I find a. a a, a, a typical dynamic that happens in this town is that we think about the adversary here and so we meet them. We think about the adversary here and so we meet them. And what I want to do is create a culture in which we think about the adversary here and we go here. 
to drive to that overmatch, to shape the agenda, to make them reactive to what we are doing, to cost impose on them. So joint force overmatch in the future. The second end state is uh, dominant decision advantage. And I will tell you that when I came up from Norfolk, um, I had hoped that perhaps that would be one of those foundational things that I can build what I do on. Um, and it wasn't where we needed to be. So think CJAD, C2, or how we think about leveraging AIML or a transition to data centricity from network centricity. Um, not where we needed to be. So given that I had four years to try to make an impact, it became an end state in its own right. And then finally, I need, uh, I need warriors that can go out and fight and win. This obviously then is the, is the people piece. And so those are the end states that, uh, that I have. There's four lines of effort to get after that. One is to provide best military advice, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, sitting in the, in the, with the National Security Council or in the tank, absolutely critical. Uh, the next is to drive force design and force development. So if you think about force design, force development, force generation, and force employment, we'll skip the first one. In force development, we're pretty good at that. The services get the money that they get, they go out and buy the things that they need, uh, they man, they train, and equip. Okay, give ourselves a pretty good grade on that. Uh, force generation, again, the services take that, uh, those forces, they train them up, they certify them, they push that heavy metal over the horizon, and they go out and then they, uh, and they, uh, to the co-columns. I think we do a good job at that. Force employment, the art and science of command that are combatant commanders forward, they're very good at that. Where I think we need more work uh, is in the force design piece. The ability then to think forward to 2035, to 2040, about where we need to be. Um, this solves Deputy Secretary Hicks's three fit it problem, if you will. The one we're in now, where we want to be out in the out years, and then the bridging strategy in between. It uh, tries to attack the central military challenge of the national military strategy, which is strategic discipline, current readiness and future readiness. How do you get there? Um, and so that this becomes uh, an animating line of effort for me. The next is data enable the force and the foundry. So I think of everything in terms of the force and the foundry, the force being going out and fighting and winning, and the foundry being all the things that enable it. Um, and you need to be able to use data in both of those. So we talked about a hypersonic world in which we live where the speed of things is just coming at us so fast and that we're gonna need, the, the warfighter's gonna need that to do his or her job into the future. Sure, and we're working really hard on that. But I also need it on the foundry side. So if Congress comes to me and says, you're asking for more readiness dollars, show me the receipt on all the money I gave you already, we can do better there. And so I wanna be able to data enable both the force and the foundry. Um, and the, the last is to create a culture of excellence. And, uh, and that's everything from crushing destructive behaviors to encouraging signature behaviors, recruiting, retention, how we train at the individual level, how we train at the composite level, live virtual constructive drops, jumps into my head on that. Um, so those are the lines of effort to, to get there. I'll give you a couple of other things that I'm trying to get right before I leave in a little over, uh, in a little over the year. I want, to, I want to get back to, the, to the, good, excuse me, the goodness we had in strategic information. We used to be able to do that pretty well back in the Cold War days. We need to be able to do that again, and so we're working pretty hard at that. I want to solve this force design problem. So we have established the Joint Future Steering Group on the Joint Staff to try to get after that in a twice a week look into the future to help the chairman because he's, uh, he's thinking about that, but also you know, he has to meet the demands of the, of the, of the current. Um, and then finally, I want to make that JROC super meaningful. I want to give it teeth so that when I say something and the, and the, and the board agrees to it, it means something. Um, and then lastly, two capabilities that I'm very concerned about that I want to get after, and that's precision navigation and timing, or all precision navigation and timing, and then electronic warfare. These are some things that I think have been underserved, and uh, with the department's help, we need to really move out on. So you've been in this role in a period of time where it feels a little bit like the world is on fire. Yeah. And, we've, and we've talked about many of those um, locales today. Ukraine, Gaza, Red Sea. Um, these obviously have created a immense series of demands on the force, but conflicts are also uh, learning labs of, of a kind. What are the lessons that you've taken 
from observing these conflicts that you think we need to do a better job of adapting into our own, everything that you just talked about, sure. force design, mm -hmm. training, yeah. worldview, et cetera? Yeah, uh, it's a, it, there's a lot there. Ukraine, uh, the Israel, Gaza, Red Sea, South China Sea, you could have mentioned all of that uh, together. You know, if I look at Ukraine as an example, you know, at the strategic level, there's some things that just jump out at you, right? Um, authoritarian regimes are here to stay. This is at the strategic level. So how we deal with them and how we pull them into the rules-based international order or whatever you want to call that, how we bring them into the, into the fray is, uh, is, uh, is important. Um, war is real. Right? We had hoped that that would go away, but uh, challenges to sovereignty around the world, most notably in Ukraine, has shown us that war is real and is an option for many. Um, and so we have to be, uh, we have to be prepared uh, for that. Nuclear weapons are real. And I say that in the, in the, uh, in the backdrop of Ukraine um, and uh, the belligerents in that case, one has nuclear weapons, the other doesn't. I think that shapes the battlefield in some respects. Um, and certainly, you know, the Iranian drive for nuclear weapons animates what we're doing, uh, what we're doing as well. So those are some things at the strategic level that are, uh, that we should be, that we should be um, uh, focusing on. Um, and oh, by the way, when we think about those things, you know, we're not the only ones learning these lessons. The adversaries are watching too. Um, so if I'm, uh, if I'm my Chinese colleague and, and they're observing, they're learning that sanctions might work, and so how do I sanction-proof myself? They're learning that Putin's generals lied to him or mine lying to me. Um, they're learning that EW works. Um, they're learning the ubiquity of uh, uncrewed systems, um, and uh, we should expect that, and we should, again, overmatch. We should be outthinking uh, that, and I, and I believe we will. So if you can go down from the strategic then, um, I think a couple of things uh, are, are takeaways for me. Um, I think two things will describe the battlefield of the future, and you and I talked a little bit about this. One is battle space transparency, that if you're on the terrestrial, on the surface of the Earth, you will be seen. And so we have this hiders finders world, and how you live within that will be really important. And then if you pair that then with the ubiquity of uncrewed systems, um, that may be matched with autonomy, then you have a whole different way, way of, uh, of thinking about the fight. Um, then throw in the fact that we learn, and hopefully not relearn, that our adversaries are thinking as well. Never forget that. So at the beginning of the Ukraine fight, we, the question was, where's Russian EW? Wasn't there when it began. It's there now. Right? And so hence EW being something that I was focused on before that started, but now I'm hyper-focused on. And if, you're gonna, if you think that uncrewed systems are gonna work in that heavy EW environment, then maybe that's not the right way to think. So this then draws us to making sure we don't draw the wrong lessons, right? That it's all about uncrewed systems, that we are actually seeing autonomy play out there right now. Maybe not so much. Lots flying, but first-person view, that's not necessarily autonomy. Um, and that we, at our peril, don't pay attention to things like dragon's teeth and trenches and mines and maneuver and mass and what we're learning about both of those in a, a battle space transparency environment. Um, so what is old is new, and, um, and uh, how do we think through those challenges going forward is also important. So of all those um, lessons mislearned, which one is your personal pet peeve that you just go, oh man, I can't believe people are looking at these conflicts. Whether, I mean, you've talked about Ukraine, but there's also you know, operations in Red Sea. Yep. There's what's going on, Israel, Gaza, South China. What is the one that you, you just um, go, we've got to dispel the thinking of X, that people think that's the lesson that came out of it? Yeah, um, I would say that, uh, um, that the, the one that concerns me is people poo-poo the old, right? Um, that we provide solutions that don't recognize how hard it is to fight through a trench or a minefield. That bothers me. Now, I'm just a squid, right? And I've learned a lot in my time on the, on the joint staff, um, and that's a huge takeaway from me. Maneuver works, yes, uh, but are we ourselves ready to punch through in that challenging environment um, and then add on top of that everything that's flying and seeing you. 
I think as an example then, if you want to go back to the battle of space transparency thing, um, it questions the, uh, the concept of mass, right? You will be seen. And so how are you going to fight through that if that's the case? And so how do you create the effects that uh, allow you to do that at your timing and tempo to get in and get out? Um, so ignoring the old in favor of the new, that's the one that bites me. Okay, got yeah. it. Um, I'm smiling because uh, I'm going to have to apologize to Peter Bergen. He asked me to give a speech soon after this, and you're, you're killing all of my points here. <laughs> um, uh, the, the transparency part, I refer to it as the idea of we may be moving into the realization of a panopticon. We're yes. All seeing. We're all just on the yeah. digital side. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to um, where you talked about all the different roles that you're playing, the j Rock, the deputies, helping to drive the budget. My sense is one of the biggest issues that you wrestle with throughout those is the balancing act between meeting the demands of today yeah. and this creating the force of tomorrow and everything from design thinking. Can you share with us your philosophy of that balancing act? How do you go through meeting the, that the, essentially it's, there's, there's while we'd like them to be complementary, there is a tension between them. There absolutely is a tension, and boy, does it play out in the tank. So if you think about the tank with the Joint Chiefs, uh, the Chairman and myself, and the Service Chiefs sitting around the table, and then up on the big screen are the, uh, are the combatant commanders, think about who owns risk and when, right? And so uh, up on the big screen are the COCOMs in that job or up to three or four years, they own the risk now. They have been given a mission, um, and the risk that they face is right now and in their face, and, and they have to be ready to fight tonight, or if not, uh, tonight very soon. Meanwhile, the service chiefs are really trying hard to modernize their force into the future, so that tension clearly plays out, um, plays out, plays out around the table. Well, a couple things uh, uh, to get after that. One, and this is going to sound like a process-oriented question, but there is a place for process, right? And so whereas we have the tank to go over all the, uh, the, red, uh, the current issues and the morning briefs and what drives and animates things over in, uh, in various fora, we also need to have a complementary focus, battle rhythm focus on the future. Um, the Army does it with the Army Futures Command, as an example. Chairman Milley was considering a Joint Futures Command. We'll see whether that plays out. Uh, but what we're doing on the Joint Staff is trying to enable the, the team to come together and focus on the future at least twice a week, once with, uh, twice with me and then, uh, and then every six weeks with the, with, the, with the Chairman. And that has driven a lot of longer-term thinking. Also, you have to take that perspective into how you set the analytical agenda. So for the department and working with uh, Secretary Hicks and, uh, and her team, what does that analytical agenda look like? Is it only now? Is it only the POM that focuses on the next five years? Or do we have the bandwidth, the capacity, the infrastructure to think longer term? And my answer to that is that we do. We just have to ask the right questions. Um, and uh, I think uh, that that is uh, that's what we're uh, that's what we're getting after. In the end, it's going to come down to priorities for sure, um, and where the uh, and, and where the where the risk is, um, and so how you set those priorities and have that discussion then um, is really really important. But uh, I think we're starting now to get our hand, and this is the FD piece, the force design piece. I think we're starting to get our arms, uh, our arms around that. What I want to be able to do then is, uh, for instance. On the JROC, we take a whole host of positions uh, on the requirements to go out and bring the joint warfighting concept, Joint Pub 1, to life. Um, interesting that I can, just the way our rules are written, I don't have a joint hammer, so I can yell pretty loudly about what we say is the requirement. Um, and so I want to put some teeth into the JROC that says, hey, we have said all of these things are legitimate and validated requirements with the services. We need to go out and move after this. Um, can I measure that? Do I have a scorecard that lets me look at the dollars that have gone to it and then whether we're actually closing those gaps? Shine a spotlight on it. The Goldwater Nichols has rightly put uh, the power in the hands of the COCOMs and the service chiefs. Um, so I have to look for other means to put some teeth into the J Rock, and that's what we're working on now. Why is that important? Because that exposes the priority challenge. Here's the readiness piece that we're working on, and here's the modernization piece. Both have requirements, but here are the modernization requirements. Let's balance those. We say you need this. 
the department decides to invest in this, that's a risk discussion, and we have that informed by data um, uh, uh, discussion uh, in all of our various forums. And so that's what I mean by putting teeth into the JROC. One of the tools that you also have, and, and you've referenced a couple elements of it, has been these variety of new initiatives that have come about in the last couple of years, whether it's um, DIU to Replicator, sure. um, where they've essentially been trying to kind of jumpstart change. But I'd like to ask you a question that um, I've been asked by everything from fellow flag officers to defense contractors. How do we take those programs which have been sort of jump-starting, how and when do they become major programs of record? Yeah, uh, you're referring obviously to the Valley of Death and how we cross that. Um, and this is a discussion that is animating the department right now. So as a small, as an element of that, who's the receiver, who's the catcher that's gonna take that program um, uh, as we bring it through the various development stages and how does that process work? Um, it's challenged. Uh, I'm here to tell you, we have the adaptive acquisition strategy. We try to work within the adaptive acquisition strategy. We have things like medium tier acquisition or software acquisition, where we try to go faster to get past that. Um, and it, uh, it uh, is imperfect for sure, but better than what we had, uh, than what we had before. Um, a couple of the challenges there, though, gets back to how we incentivize the industrial base um, and how we reconcile the, the multi-cycle world that we live in, right? And um, so what is that multi-cycle world? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we have an election cycle, we're certainly in the middle of that, two, three, two, four, six year election cycle. We have a FIDIP cycle where we are marching our way through building the future year uh, defense plan. We have the media cycle, what's that, 20? 24 hours, 24 minutes, I don't know. Um, the attention span of the American public, pretty small these days, right, for all various, uh, the various reasons. We have a, 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 a multi-cycle element that is the adversary who's thinking long, 2050, 2049, beyond, that kind of thing. Um, and then you have the, the cycle time of industry where they wanna fail fast, and they're, they're, in, they're in, 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 uh, in a cycle of months. Right? Not even the two years that a medium tier acquisition can bring to it. So how do we reconcile and bring that together? Well, I think there's a couple of ways that we're gonna have to get after it. One is we certainly have a very strong compliance culture, right? Um, that is born of 60 years of incremental addition to the oversight that we have for all the right reasons. Uh, we need to be better partners and, and perform better with, uh, with, uh, with Congress who has put that oversight on us. But here's an example. Um, in 1956, the Army's request for their budget was zero dollars because they had a whole bunch of surplus coming out of Korea and they were able to just reprogram that money to the, to the, to the next year. We don't have that authority to do. Um, back in the middle 60s, about 8% of your budget you could reprogram. We're down to around 1%. Um, and so we have this oversight that we need to uh, that we need to live within all the right reasons. So we have to work with Congress to think what's the right answer. And so the the department and the, especially the chairman has been thinking about how do we um, how do we leverage things like multi-year procurement? Mm -hmm. um, how do we leverage uh, going faster? Um, whether it's with uh, you know, more budget authority that uh, that we might be able to might be able to use. It's hard to prototype though. Right? when you can't then p pivot quickly to um, a program of record. Um, and so these are, these are structural things that, uh, that we're, we're working within. DIU, DARPA, there's some over 100 entities that are doing innovation, all really, really good work. Um, and so how we we're harnessing that um, and then creating the incentive structure for, the, for that, in, uh, that uh, entrepreneur, that innovator, uh, to bring their solutions to us is important. A couple other things on that. One is, I think I can help with and do a better job is elucidating what is the requirement. So having a more transparent dialogue with industry and others on this is what we need, this is, this is how we're gonna fight. One way we've gone after that, by the way, um, is in our series of globally integrated war games where we have stood up an industry cell. 
It started two years ago where we had eight of, the, uh, of our industry colleagues participate in that at the, at the fully cleared level. We were up to over 20 this year and really brought tremendous insights. I think they learned what we need to fight and we learned what they can bring to the fight. And so that kind of dialogue um, is going to be uh, uh, increasingly valuable as we go forward. So as you're aware, this is the 10th year anniversary of this event, and I should have added that it's uh, online at hashtag future security forum. So if you're doing it, please mark it that way. At New America. Uh, at New America. Um, Quick learning. <laughs> and Arizona State University. Um, so, um, and then you know my background working on future warfare issues. One of the prior sessions by another Peter, Peter Skoblik, looked at um, prediction and policy making and actually involved this whole audience. So I'd like to uh, put you um, on the mark here for a bit of help at my job and our collective jobs at looking at the future. So imagine that we're gathered in this room 10 years from now for the 20th anniversary of this event. What will we be talking about? What would the vice chairman in that 10 years out, what would be top of mind for them? Um, what would be the same? What might be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a different, uh, is the question what do I hope it is or what, what will it be? Let's, you, you just, okay, follow up question. So yeah. uh, let's do, what you hope it will be, yeah. let's do what you think it will be. Yeah, thanks. I, I, well, I would hope that um, standards and norms that, that define the international order have been reaffirmed, things like sovereignty and independence, uh, free market capitalism and all the rest, um, and that uh, all nations have moved into play within that uh, system. Um, I, I, would, I would like to see that. Um, I would certainly like to see um, a, a joint structure that has instantiated fully this focus on the future outcome, um, where we continue to learn, where we continue to look forward, where we never learn the previous war's lessons, and that we, uh, that we have uh, gotten past that. Um, I would hope that, uh, that um, uh, we have continued our emphasis on what I would say is integrating in the third axis. If the x-axis is integrating across all domains and the y-axis is across all echelons, the z-axis is with our allies and partners. And so allies and partners is defined by the seven treaties allies we have or the partners we have or with uh, a different definition or more expanded definition of partners, whether it's academia or the media or Congress um, or the defense industri industrial base. I would hope that we have a defense industrial base that have, has all the attributes that we're looking for um, in terms of agility, uh, uh, resiliency, um, uh, uh, one that is continued to be built on competition, where there's a free flow of capital, um, and where they can see who we are and can respond to that demand signal quicker. And I would hope that we have solved the, and had met the bar with the Congress on this oversight issue such that we have improved authorities to move as fast as, um, as we can. Um, so where, where will we be? I think we'll be tilting at many of those issues. Um, you know, one is I think we have hit the envelope and we're pressing very hard on Goldwater Nichols right now, some 40 years on. And so what is the evolution of thinking there? Um, and- uh, Can you unpack that for me? Is it pressing on it? What do, what do yeah, you so, so if you think about um, uh, the unified command plan where the uh, preeminency put in the, in the COCOMs, um, every fight is a global fight. That was built on a regional uh, thinking, um, and so how do we? How uh, how does the chairman execute his role as the global integrator, right? That's the reality that we're in now. There is no regional fight anymore. Everything is a global fight, again across uh, across all domains. Um, so we're pushing against that. That's on the force side. On the foundry side, if everything is a joint problem, then should the vice chairman or someone have a hammer that says, that's not joint enough, we're not doing that, we're gonna be directive. Interesting to note, my colleagues in, uh, in the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, 
all have a joint hammer that they can drop, I don't. That's fine, but I think we're, we're hitting the edges of that. If you agree with me that, again, with the possible exception of the undersea, everything's a joint problem, then maybe, uh, maybe there needs to be a different way we think about those, uh, uh, those authorities. So I think we're pushing on the edges of that now. Um, you know, the law says that we have a joint staff and not a general staff. Okay, um, if the chairman's gonna be the global integrator, how do we build that? I'm not advocating for a general staff, but does he have what he needs to do that job in this global fight? That's something we need to talk about. So that's where we're, where we're, where we're pushing against it. Um, the, yeah, I think one of the questions you asked was, will we be in a fight with whomever? Yeah. I'm not gonna ask you to, to uh, so th what they were asked is, what are the um, likelihood? So uh, essentially, would we be in a fight with, uh, would there be an invasion of Taiwan? Would there be a major terrorist? And what was interesting about it was the relative percentages coming from the group. So I'm not gonna put yeah. you on the spot and I ask guess what, for, here, Here's what I will say, yeah. on, uh, not giving you a number, right? Yeah. Um, it's not inevitable though. Right, and um, I'm aligned with the secretary and the chairman on this. It is not inevitable. We can still shape this. We can still help determine the, those outcomes. We can still encourage our allies and partners to work with us. We can still be the partner of choice, and, and we just have to continue to, uh, to uh, press on that. I do think the probability of buffoonery is going up. That, that, you know, there are things that keep you up at night and there are things that wake you up at night. So these spark points around the world where chaos can reign and then kind of spin up really quickly, maybe given that multi-cycle world we live in where the new cycle is so fast or however that plays out. So there are spark points there uh, that, we need to, that we need to watch. And so, uh, you know, um, the, uh, as I say, the probability of buffoonery goes up and up when there's more uncertainty and we don't understand red lines of the adversary or something like that. And, uh, and so I think uh, we have to work really hard to try to get past that um, so that uh, you know, we can keep things at, a, at an even keel. Um, all that to say that it's probably gonna be a more dangerous world on one hand, and on the other hand, we will still have hard choices to make given the budget constraints that uh, are, are, we, we will likely face. I think then, just to finish up, what we're seeing then is a return to simultaneity as the, as the prime challenge, mm. where our unipolar moment has gone past unipolar to past bipolar, past multipolar to multi multinodal, right? And that's probably a return to history, if you think about it. I think history is replete with examples of uh, concert of Europe, great power competition, uh, where w uh, one power is met with others who have the wherewithal to compete. And, and uh, I think we're back to that. Um, that makes the world more challenging and contested. And then we're gonna have to balance that against what we're able to afford uh, working forward. Um, we do get a lot of money, uh, there's no doubt about that. So it's time to start thinking and acting differently. Um, and I think that's what the secretary and the chairman are asking us to do. Got it, thank you. So let's open it up to questions from the group. Um, first hand was right there. And do we have mics to carry over? Yes. And um, the two things that uh, at least I as moderator require is please introduce yourself and all questions end with a question mark. Uh, Dave Maxwell, the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy. Thank you for your remarks. You mentioned um, overmatch. I think it's clear we're trying to outfight the enemy. Number one, are we working to outthink the enemy? Are we getting doctrinal and, and concept overmatch? And you mentioned Joint Pub 1, uh, which I commend the Joint Staff for. I think it's a, a good document. Mm -hmm. Two forms of warfare, conventional warfare and irregular warfare. Eight paragraphs, or seven paragraphs to conventional warfare, 18 paragraphs to irregular warfare. Are we putting enough emphasis on irregular warfare as we are on conventional warfighting? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the first part of the question um, was, are we outthinking the adversary? This has been a high priority with the Deputy Secretary and I to really energize that analytical agenda that we talked about before. Um, and so the, the transition of the joint warfighting concept as an example from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 to joint pub one is an example of that. Um, obviously we can't talk about what it, it is in it, what it, what's in it from uh, in, in this forum. Uh, but it is pretty revolutionary thinking when, uh, uh, as we put the joint force together to, to, to meet the fight of the, uh, of the future. 
Um, and so then how do you then translate that down to the force? Well, first making a joint pub and doctrine was critical. And this is uh, General Milley's emphasis, uh, Chairman Milley's emphasis was to get that done. But then how that translates into exercising and experimentation and other doctrine that is written, um, that's the next step that the J7 and the J8 are driving. Uh, with the with the services and the and the cocoms, I'm pretty confident that we are moving um, in uh, in that direction. Um, conventional warfare versus irregular warfare. Um, yeah, you can do the paragraph count all you like, but I think we have the right emphasis on conventional warfare. Um, but irregular warfare, I think, is changing to suit that. If it's a supported supporting, you know, we're no longer 20 years in the desert where it was that kind of fight. It's now a different fight, and what, what SOF and other elements can bring from an irregular fight um, uh, are important. All the other elements of irregular warfare are certainly important, too. So I talked a little bit about um, trying to get back to our ability to dominate in the information, um, in the information domain. That's an example of that. So the, uh, how we play in the strategic information space is really, really important. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I'm confident in that. I, I, that we know how to do that and we can get back to it. What I would like to be more confident is can we do it faster? And so that's my job, I think, is to try to bend that curve um, uh, to, uh, to do it faster. And then to finish, you know, JWC 3.0 is not an end state in any way, shape, or form. It's constantly being a, assessed uh, on a battle rhythm enabled basis, but we're driving to what it's going to look like in 2040. That's the next piece of work that is uh, being done. Um, and so we'll draw on these lessons learned. We'll try not to draw the wrong lessons learned. We'll look at disruptive technologies. Um, and, uh, and then we'll look at kind of the, the things that are going to stay immutable uh, in a fight. And that's the, next that's the next evolution of that. So it's not a static, the JWC is not a static world. What we wanted to avoid was a document that had a lot of work, a lot of buy-in, and then sat on the shelf. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, we are trying super hard not to let that happen, and we have not. And so when I listen to the dialogue and the discourse on the part of the services, and as they start to talk JWC and their piece of it, that to me is one measure of effectiveness that we have kind of come over the top and we are now driving into something that has been, is being fully instantiated within the, within the joint force. Okay. Mr. Mitty, we're not forgetting you. All right, uh, let's, go. That. let's go with Doug. Hi, Doug Olivet, also here at New America. Um, I want to drill down a little bit on how you think about the old and the new. You know, you, you've talked about the new a lot. You mentioned your need for P&T, which is probably the foundational technology for so much of what is the new. Um, but you then also talked about mine clearing fortifications. I assume you mean tanks, holes in the water. Um, both just at a macro level and then particularly as the vice chair, how do you think about the trade-offs and the balances between these two? Yeah, so first it starts with the requirement. And so this is an interesting debate on the requirement, right? And my philosophy on the requirement is the requirement is a requirement, right? So we're going to establish what that should be, what that looks like, so whether it's countermining or our own use of mining, right, as we work through all the ethical and political ramifications of that uh, and, and, and legal ramifications of that. Um, uh, so that we will establish the requirement. Whether we move out in that at the, at the full level or some part level, that's a risk calculus that we will then take forward to the, to the deputy and the, and the secretary as they prioritize then what's important. So rest assured then that the requirement on countermining or on mining, uh, both in the maritime domain or um, uh, in, uh, in the land domain, will be well established, it'll be analytically based, um, and then we have to decide and prioritize whether we want to um, invest in that. And that's the rest of the infrastructure beyond just the requirements. My own personal view, though, is uh, you know, um, we can establish the requirement. We have to make sure we establish the, the training and the sustaining and all the other things that go with it. And then we have to practice it. Right? And so my own experience having commanded an MCM back uh, in the, in the uh, late 90s was we were just then transitioning mine warfare in the Navy to mainstream uh, because it was so important to allow us to fight our way in. That kind of thinking has to continue. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see where we, where we are in that. I think that uh, 
uh, again, we can learn the wrong lessons and forget that and maybe just wish that away. We cannot wish that away um, uh, going forward. So uh, it's hard, gritty, dirty work. It takes investment, practice, training, the right people who know how to do it, an understanding of the timelines that it imposes on, uh, on, the, on the fight. Um, we at our peril don't do that. Um, that's, again, forgetting the uh, old in favor of the new. So we've had someone from the right and the left. Is there anyone online to give an opportunity for that as well? Can you bring the, the mic for our reader? Yeah, this question is from um, Anonymous online. Um, I think you... <laughs> is that actual <laughs> Anonymous? Or, okay. Maybe it has a question mark at the end. <laughs> How can we implement joint, joint force overmatch while effectively balancing escalation management, particularly as conflict is increasingly asymmetric? Hmm. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, uh, you um, you bring the output of overmatch to escalation management, to leveraging asymmetric um, uh, asymmetric thinking, asymmetric investments. So um, uh, I, I'm, I guess I would push back a little bit on the premise of the question, uh, and that is an output of overmatch is that you are able to manage escalation, that you are able to think globally, that you are able to think asymmetrically and in and, and, and other areas. Um, and so the output then has to take all of the, the output of that uh, has to take all of those things into, uh, into perspective. Um, if the question is, is it asymmetric or conventional? Yeah, that's a balance. That gets back to my friend's question over here about uh, irregular warfare as an example. But if we're not thinking asymmetrically, right, that I think is foundational to achieving overmatch, right? They're strong here, they're weak here. Okay, let's go there, right? Um, uh, there's no blinding flash of the obvious there. So I think asymmetric thinking is absolutely foundational uh, uh, to achieving uh, overmatch. Um, of course, uh, it also relies on what our great strengths are, right? And that's our people, the emphasis on mission command, uh, the industrial base that we have that others don't, you know, all of that. And so leveraging that, again, I think is uh, agnostic of the end states and the outcomes that the question presupposes. When, when our goal is overmatch, what are the attributes of it that you're seeking to achieve? So, you know, there's one concept and you sort of laid out, which is that you're, at a, you're here and I'm here. I'm just so much better than you, not by a marginal amount. Mm -hmm. There's another concept, which is sort of the, um, the Jackie Fisher pre-World War I. You were invested in X, you thought you were doing really good. I just changed the game. Everything that you invested in, yep. you know, uh, this type of old dreadnought, well, I've got battle cruisers. When you think about overmatch, what are the attributes that you are looking for to achieve it? Yeah, what I'm looking for is the answer to this question on the part of the adversary. Is today the day? Right, so enough uncertainty and questioning that, hmm, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm not ready. Today may not be the day as I look at, um, uh, the direction that uh, uh, that we're going. Um, I, so whether you quantify that in a difference in a delta there, I, we could parse that, I suppose. But what the, the question, the answer I want is today's not the day. Mm -hmm. Don't have what I need to get this job done. Um, so that's the bottom line uh, uh, effect that I'm trying to generate. Got it, okay. Um, in a certain way, we, we did a project with SOCOM that um, it was, what winning would look like in the Pacific. And it was a narrative told from the story of a PLA general 20 years from now looking back and lamenting these are the reasons why we never, there was never the right day to invade Taiwan. It just never happened, it never turned for us. Okay, um, let's get, uh, well, Peter Bergen gets um, right of question, so go for it. Peter Bergen of New America. You know, it sort of relates to this overmatch question. If, you know, it used to be that, you know, we want in an autonomous systems, the United States view was you always wanted a human in, uh, in the loop. And now we talk about a human on the loop. Mm -hmm. But if the adversaries uh, don't really care about either in the loop or on the loop, uh, are we allowing them an overmatch by essentially sort of taking the position that we uh, want a human on the loop still? 
No, I, I don't think so. Um, so if I could just kind of go down one squirrel point. Sure. You know, when you and I were talking about science fiction presaging the future and we were exchanging stories, the one that I didn't bring up was Skynet, right? Uh, from uh, from uh, Terminator. Terminator, right? Which is what you're describing, right? Autonomous entities making all of the decisions without a man in the loop. Um, I think we can build uh, we can build what we need with a man on the loop, a person on the loop that still moves as fast as we want, but yet maintains the responsible AI that the, that the department is driving to. Um, whether the adversary is doing that or not, that's okay. But I think that we can keep person on the loop if we do it right. And I actually think we have to. Um, uh, I think it's an imperative uh, to do that. So I don't think it's unobtainium to say that if they're doing one way and we're doing the other that we can't keep pace. I'm pretty confident that we can. Okay. Uh, yes, over here. Uh, blue shirt. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Kropansky, unaffiliated. Uh, one term I haven't heard mentioned all day is uh, deterrence. So I'm wondering, simple question, is deterrence dead? Uh, so is deterrence in your wheelhouse and uh, how do you see uh, deterrence uh, evolving over the next 10 years? And how did you feel when Russia went into Ukraine about this concept of deterrence? How, why didn't we deter them at all? Was, why was NATO unable to you know, prevent that? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so uh, it's interesting you haven't had that discussion come up in the previous sections uh, either. Well, I feel like you, you everything about overmatch, how you defined it, was deterrence. It could be. That's exactly where I was going to go, right? And so um, if the answer to the question today is not today, what is that? That's, de that's deterrence. So there's the, there's the answer that, that, overmatch, um, that overmatch would yield. There's a, several elements about deterrence that I find fascinating. One, just like strategic information and the use of it, I think in deterrence, the people, the thinkers that we have on deterrence theory, um, you know, is, is that an element of the great retirement? How does that work? Regenerating part of that analytical agenda on how we think about deterrence is absolutely critical. So if Tony Cotton, the STRATCOM commander, was here, he and I talk about that a lot, and we're trying to regenerate our ability to think that through. Where's the next Thomas Schilling, right, who's going to write uh, about game theory to help us understand that? So why is that important? Because deterrence is different now. Again, nothing is static in the world we live in, and deterrence is one of those, right? So deterrence, when you and I were growing up, was against one adversary, one peer adversary. Now it's at least against two peer adversaries who think about deterrence in a different way, and that's just nuclear deterrence. So now let's throw, uh, let's throw conventional deterrence on top of that, and then add the, uh, achieving the, um, uh, the end state that is integrated deterrence with it, uh, and then throw in other actors, uh, you know, arguably, uh, you know, the, this multi-nodal uh, world we're living in, where you have folks like the Houthis and others, with their deterrence there as well. Um, so we have to rethink how we're doing that, and so we're trying to regenerate that as part of the analytical agenda uh, with uh, DepSec Def's leadership uh, to make that happen. Okay, so that's one. Um, the second is the dynamic that we just described about deterrence in this multi, multi, multi-nodal world. It's very different now uh, than it was before. Um, you could parse the the Ukraine uh, answer in a in a in a couple of ways. Um, you say that we didn't deter him from coming into Ukraine, but we certainly deterred him from attacking NATO, and we have still done that, right? And. Um, uh, so that's a win, uh, in my view, um, particularly juxtaposed against his strategic failure to take Kiev in 96 hours and then to thus expand NATO and all the other things, right? So um, I, I think it's arguable whether we deter it or not. Um, but deterrence, and the, the, I guess my final point on this, is deterrence really, really builds on credibility. And so that force design that leads to force development, force generation, and force employment that we have, that we talked about, um, that leads to that overmatch, that's what drives the credibility that we're going to need. And um, we can do it by spending more money, uh, and we can do it by, uh, by thinking and acting differently. And that's, I think, the demand that we have now. Well, Admiral, um, 
you answered the first question by laying out a wide variety of activities and responsibilities that you have, and that makes us all the more appreciative of you taking the time out to join us for such a rich uh, conversation today. So please join me in a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks for having me.